Okay, uh, so we've been talking about uh, last time stoichiometry. Uh, we talked about basic stoichiometry problems. Uh, we also talked about uh, limiting reagent problems. A reminder that uh, really kind of your basic stoichiometry problems. There's really four steps that you follow, and that is obviously balance an equation. That is convert whatever they give you into moles. Then really the third step is actually the stoichiometry part is the mole to mole relationship that you get from the balance equation. So remember really stoichiometry is just a conversion factor where we use the actual balance equation to do the conversion uh, rather than say looking it up in a table or anything like that. And the fourth step is really you should always be in moles at that point. You probably will have to convert it to some other units. And really it's these same four steps, no matter how complicated the problem may look or how complicated the numbers may be. Uh, it is just these four steps. How we know it's sort of a basic stoichiometry problem uh, usually is you're really only given sort of one piece of information. So you're given information about a reactant maybe or information about a product. And that's really all you're given. And that's how you know, sort of just this basic stoichiometry sort of problem. We also talk about limiting reagent problems, which for the most part, you could kind of approach the same way, except that with limiting reagents, it is the limiting reagent, which is the most important. It determines how much product you make. And along with the limiting reagent, there's also the excess reagent where we have pretty much plenty of, so you have plenty of the excess reagent. It'll be left over when it's all said and done and this reaction is complete. The reason why the limiting again is the most important here is frankly, uh, if you need both reactants to make the product and you run out of one, there's no possible way to make any more products. So it's always the one that determines uh, how much products that you would make. That's why in a limiting reagent problem, you do need to basically figure out at some point uh, what is the limiting reagent uh, for you to do that. How you know it's a limiting reagent problem is typically you are given enough information to calculate the moles of the reactants. So Definitely in most cases is two reactants. So in most cases, if you're given enough information for both of the reactants, whatever units they may be in, and you are able to, with the information given to you, get to moles, that is definitely a limiting reagent problem. You do need to figure it out. As we talked about, there really is multiple ways you could solve these type of problems. Again, a, a very common way is to just to do two separate stoichiometry problems between each reactant and the product and figure out how much each one makes. And the one that makes the least amount of product uh, would be your limiting reagent. And also that would be your theoretical yield. Uh, you also can do, like we talked about yesterday as well, uh, sort of take both reactants and do a little stoichiometry calculation between both reactants where you try to figure out, you know, do I have enough of one reactant to use up completely the other reactant? So you do that calculation, you compare, how much you started with to how much you need to use up the other reactant. And if it is less than you started with, then that's a limiting reagent. If it's more than what you started with, then um, I'm sorry, if it's less than what you started with, then that's the excess reagent. And if it's more than what you started with, it is the limiting reagent. The third way that we sort of talked about really mainly was to use, uh, was again, sometimes referred to as an ice table to do that. And again, sort of the benefit of the ice table as we talked about is, it does allow you very quickly to really answer any type of stoichiometry question that you may be asked, how much of each product, how much of the excess is left over when it's all said and done. The idea of this is, for example, if we had like 2A plus 3B goes to 2C, we would do an ice table where initially uh, we would take the moles of each of these guys. So, you know, we'll just say we had uh, three moles of this guy, two moles of this guy, and zero of our product. The idea here with the change is we represent a change with an X value and the reaction should be heading to the product side, which means our reaction should be decreasing with time and our product should be increasing with time. 
Uh, so this would be minus 3x, minus 2x, and plus 2x. The 2, the 3, and the 2 here are the coefficients, and that's really important to make sure that you do include them in that change line. Otherwise, you will have the wrong uh, multiple relationships, so you'll get that incorrect. When we get to the equilibrium, we just going to, or the end here, we're just going to carry everything down. And this is a bad example here, but we'll go with it. Uh, actually, that should be 3x, huh? That is a 3x. That one, that's a 2x. Sorry. Should read the coefficients better. There we go. That's a 2. That's a 3. There we go. That's better. Uh, so in this particular case, what we would do is set each of these equal to 0. And we would solve for x whatever it may equal, not zero, but whatever it equals. And we would do the same thing for our other guy here, set it equal to zero and then solve for X. And whichever X value is the smallest would be your limiting reagent. And again, uh, that X would be every single X that's in here. And that would be in moles and it allows you really quickly again to get whatever you need. The last one we sort of tied into this was the idea of uh, percent yield and percent yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical times 100%. Uh, the actual yield is typically what you get when you actually do the experiment. It is usually given to you in book type problems. The theoretical yield, you do need to calculate however it is a limiting reagent problem, non limiting reagent type problem. Any questions on any of those things that we did there? <clears throat> All right, then let's take a look at one more here to wrap sort of this up here. All right, based on this reaction here, if 100 grams of ammonia reacts with 100 grams of carbon dioxide and 120 grams of our product here is produced, what is the percent yield? Give you some info here. We'll go with nitrogen 1401, carbon 1201, and we got there, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, 1.008. All right, take a few minutes, see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look and uh, see how we're doing. Uh, so in this case, we're taking 100 grams of ammonia and 100 grams of our carbon dioxide. Uh, once again, that is both reactants, and we definitely could get the moles of each of those. So we definitely know this is a limiting reagent type problem. Uh, we're looking for the percent yield. Uh, which again is our actual divided by our theoretical times 100%. In this case, 120 grams is our actual. So we do need to calculate our theoretical here using stoichiometry. And now that we know it's a limiting reagent problem, that's helpful as well. Regardless sort of a what method did you use, pretty much the first couple of steps are pretty much the same. We have an equation that's balanced. Uh, in this case, we do want to convert each of those things into moles. So we'll take our 100 grams of NH3. Once again, we'll go to the periodic table and calculate the molar mass of NH3. So that's like a 14 and three. So that's 1703 grams per mole from the periodic table. Again, one nitrogen and three hydrogens there. And I hit the right number there. Here our grams will cancel and it looks like we end up with for that guy. About 5.872 moles of NH3. We'll do the same thing here for our uh, carbon dioxide. So 100 grams of CO2. Once again, go in the periodic table, one carbon at 12.01 and two oxygens at 16 each. Gives you 4401 grams per mole from the periodic table for the molar mass. Once again, a reminder that... <clears throat> When you do calculate the molar mass, it is just based on the formula, regardless of the coefficient you see in an equation. So make sure you don't add anything more to it. So that's 2.272 moles of CO2. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to uh, kind of do the ice table approach that we were talking about yesterday. So I'm just gonna rewrite the equation here, 2NH3 plus uh, CO2 gives us this guy here. All right. 
So we're going to start with our initial moles of each of these guys, which would be 5.872 moles of that and 2.272 moles of this guy. Once again, we could safely assume zero for our starting amounts of everybody else. Change part here. Once again, we do want to make sure we take into account the coefficients, which is the stoichiometry. So this would be minus 2x. Uh, this would be minus x. This would be plus x. And this guy would also be plus x at that point. Bringing down to our end line here, 5.872 minus 2x and 2.272 minus x, x and x. Any questions on sort of the setup there of the table? <clears throat> At this point, this is where we can figure out our limiting reagent by setting each of those reactants equal to zero and solving for x. So uh, 5.872 minus 2x equals zero, basically taking the 2x to the other side which means we're essentially just dividing by two in this case. Gives us a uh, 2.936 moles for this guy. Setting this guy equal to zero will essentially give us our answer. And that would be X is equal to 2.272 moles. In this case, we're looking for the smallest, which means this would be the smallest and that would be our limiting reagent in this case. So the CO2 is our limiting reagent. Our NH3 in this case is the excess reagent. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? So again, you don't really need this calculation anymore. And as we talked about last time, uh, what we just solved for is pretty much every X that we do see in this table. So again, it is every single one of these X's is that guy. In this case, we're interested in our product. Uh, so we can uh, look at our table there and we see that at the end there, the moles of our product will equal X, which means in this case, it is 2.272 moles of NH2 to CO. This technically would be our theoretical yield in moles, uh, but we do want it in grams since our actual yields in grams, so all the units are the same. So uh, we will then use the molar mass from the periodic table. Again, uh, two nitrogens, four hydrogens, a carbon and an oxygen, and that does give you 60.06 grams per mole, I believe, of this guy. The moles will cancel and we will end up in this case with not that 2.272 times 60.06, about 136.5 grams of our product, which once again would be our theoretical yield, along with this guy, which would be the moles. <laughs> First off, any questions on that there? <clears throat> all right, so the last thing that we're really looking for here is the percent yield. So now we have all the information we need to calculate our percent yield. And that would be our actual, which was given to us. And I believe it was 120 grams, if I'm not mistaken. Divided by our theoretical that we just calculated, 136.5 grams times 100%. And... <clears throat> Looks like 87.91 has our percent yield. Not terrible. Question on any of those steps there. <clears throat> now, again, the sort of benefit of this table, as we saw last time, and obviously it was not asked for in this problem, was you know if we also want to know, you know, how many water we had, the moles of water from the table would also equal x which means once again, it would be 2.272 moles of water, which you could then multiply by the molar mass of water, 1802 grams per mole. And very quickly, you can figure out that you would also produce about 40.94 grams of water with not too much work there if you wanted to. The other thing was we could also use this table if we want to know how much of our excess reagent is left over, which would be this situation here. 
Uh, we could take our excess left over, and that would be 5.872 minus two times our X. And that would tell us that we would have left over 5.872 minus two times 2.272, about 1.328 moles of NH3 left over. I'll go this way, you can multiply it by 1703. And you would have about 22.61 grams of NH3 left over. So again, you can see very quickly, you can answer any question that you might want uh, to know in this case. Obviously we started with 100 grams of NH3, so we use about you know, 70 some odd grams in this reaction. Any questions on limiting reagent problems? doing the ice table or any of those types of things. <clears throat> okay, so obviously you need to be able to solve stoichiometry problems, basic stoichiometry problems, limiting reagent problems. You need to be able to figure out how much of the products was produced in a limiting reagent problem. You need to figure out obviously how much of the excess reagents left over and all that kind of stuff. All right, so we're gonna change gears just a little bit here. Uh, we're going to talk and I'll just scroll this across in case you want to see the alternative method to it. The one we just did there, I believe. And hopefully they got the same answer, which would be good. That's good, they did. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about concentration. We're gonna also talk about solutions and we'll talk about molarity and, and things of that nature. So first we'll start with a solution. Uh, a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. Homogeneous means that they basically mix together. Everything mixes well. Uh, in a solution, everything looks the same throughout. Uh, and really in a solution, there's two parts that make up a solution. Uh, the first part is what is known as the solute. The solute is a smaller part of the solution. Uh, and the solvent. The solvent is the larger part of the solution. So the solute and the solvent together uh, makes a solution. A solution is typically, once again, uh, the things that get the aqueous symbol usually next to it. And as we talked about, I think maybe earlier on as well, you know, again, there's a difference between L and aqueous. Uh, L is a pure liquid. So that is something that's just one substance by itself. So for example, again, if we took something like water, that would get a pure liquid sort of symbol. Now, if we took something like water, as we might have talked about before, and you mix it with something like solid sodium chloride, when you take both of those guys together, the sodium chloride is going to dissolve in the water and it basically will dissolve and you will end up with basically salt water. So the combination of that is a sodium chloride solution, which would get the aqueous symbol next to it. The good news is if it is a solution, the name of the solution is the solute. So a sodium chloride solution, the solute would be sodium chloride. Uh, you know, if you had a potassium bromide solution, potassium bromide would be it. So in this case, the sodium chloride would be our solute and water would be our solvent. Water is a very common solvent that's used in a lot of situations as non-toxic and it works well with a lot of things like ionic things, things that are polar. So it works really well as a solvent. Although we oftentimes think of water as sort of the solvent and always the solvent, uh, water is not always the correct solvent or is not always used as a solvent in, a, in several situations. Uh, for example, if you use water as a solvent for something that is non-polar, uh, it would not work. They would not mix together or anything like that. So this idea of like dissolves like, so things with very similar sort of uh, interactions can be very soluble in each other. So polar things and polar things are soluble in each other. Ionic things and polar things are soluble in each other. And nonpolar and nonpolar things are soluble in each other. But if you try to take something that's polar and nonpolar together, not so good. They really don't mix and stuff like that. So we do think of the solvent a lot of times as water, but it's not always the best choice in some situations. 
we also sometimes think of solutions as you know sort of being in the liquid state if you will but really solutions can technically be in any, any state. Uh, so air, for example, is an example of a mixture of two or more substances. Uh, there's oxygen, argon, um, methane, and other things, depending on what air you're breathing. But really the major component of air is actually nitrogen is the actual major uh, element there in air. Oxygen is second. Uh, so for example, solder as well, uh, the solvent or larger part is lead and the solute part is tin in that case. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about uh, first off molarity and molarity is really the uh, most common unit of concentration that we see. Molarity is uh, the big M and molarity does mean moles per liter. And we can rearrange this like a formula and we can use it to solve for any one of those things. So if we wanted to know liters, liters would be moles divided by molarity. And if we wanted moles, it would be liters times molarity. I would say in chemistry, we use all these guys pretty much. You hear a lot of times you need to figure out the molarity. Uh, a lot of times you need to figure out liters. And in a lot of cases, especially as we'll talk about here towards the end of this, uh, in solution stoichiometry, figuring out the moles using liters and molarity is really, really important. If you are using molarity in the standalone edition, if you will, like this, uh, the volume 100% needs to be in liters and it does need to be converted to liters to do that. When we use something like molarity, it's a really great idea not to leave it as big M and just convert it into moles per liter. And that way you can actually see the volume unit because it's very common when people just leave it as big M, they frankly have no idea where the volume is. Is it on top? Is it on the bottom? Should I multiply? Should I divide? And people really screw up most of the time uh, when they do that. So it's really good to get rid of the big M there when you're doing calculations. So you can see both units, kind of do it like a dimensional analysis problem. You can see the units cancel and you usually be in pretty good shape. Uh, so for example, if we did have something like 4.5 molar sodium chloride, uh, when we see something like that, what that means is it is 4.50 moles of sodium chloride per liter. So the number always stays with the moles part is always per liter. And you could really use it like a conversion factor. You could use it like that. But if you need to divide, uh, you could throw the liters up on top in the 4.5 moles there on the bottom. So it's a really good idea not to kind of leave the big M in, in calculations because again, a lot of times people just kind of lose track of the volume part of it uh, when you're doing it. Now, for the most part, this is uh, the units that we do associate with moles per liter. If you happen to multiply molarity times uh, milliliters, which is a very common thing that people do, you actually do not get moles. You get what are known as millimoles, which is like a thousand fold different than moles. So you actually get millimoles when you do that. Now, if you do that and then you divide by milliliters again, that's okay because the milliliters will cancel and you'll be back to moles per liter. So if you want to be safe, a lot of times you just want to convert it to liters. Definitely 100% of the time, if you are using molarity by itself and not really in a dilution type situation, but just molarity by itself, definitely want to do uh, liters. But you also sometimes see people say that molarity is millimoles over milliliters, which is correct because again, the millis cancel out and you end up back to, like I had over there, moles per liter. So stand alone, 100%, make sure you get to liters. We will see a formula a little bit later when we talk about uh, dilution where you can leave it in milliliters, uh, but as long as you divide by milliliters, everything works out okay. But if you wanna be safe, always convert it to liters and you should always get the right answer and stuff like that. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Now, obviously, the uh, larger the molarity value there, the more concentrated it is, the less, uh, the smaller the value of uh, M, the more dilute it is. 
So if you're dealing with something that's like 18 molar hydrochloric acid, it is super strong. Uh, if you're dealing with something like 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid, it's not that bad. It's pretty dilute at that point. All right, so why don't we take a look at one here? What is the mass of potassium iodide that's required uh, to make 500 milliliters of a 2.8 molar solution? So why don't you give it a go, see what you come up with. Potassium is 39.10. And iodine is a lot, 126.9. Yeah, let's take a look. Uh, so if we're not sure uh, what to do here, we want the uh, mass, which would be the grams of potassium iodide required to make 500 milliliters. Uh, so we do have the volume basically given to us and we do have the molarity given to us. So if we're not sure, that would probably be a great place to start with to figure out the moles. Uh, because once we have moles, we can obviously use the molar mass to go from moles to uh, grams in that case. So to do this here, uh, we do want to maybe adjust some things. We do need to convert this into liters. So here our molarity is moles per liter, and we're going to solve for moles. So moles would be times the molarity. So taking our 500 milliliters, and we're going to divide it by 1,000 or just move the decimal place of three places to the left there, going to give us 0.5 liters. When we see this 2.8 molar, we could say that is 2.8 moles of Ki per liter. And again, we can flip it around the other way if we needed to. And once again, this just allows you to kind of see both units there. So if you want to take more of a dimensional analysis approach, 0.5 liters, we got liters up on top, so we definitely need liters on the bottom. So we're going to multiply here by this number, 2.8 moles of Ki per liter. Liters here will cancel, and that will get us 0.5 times 2.8, 1.40 moles of Ki. At this point, we do want grams, so we're going to use the molar mass here, and it looks like we just need to add them together. So that's going to give us 39.10 uh, plus a 126.9. Looks like a 166 grams per mole. So we'll use our molar mass here and multiply it by the 166 grams per mole of Ki. And that will get us about... 232 grams of Ki would be needed in this case. <clears throat> Any questions on that calculation? So basically what this means is you would weigh out about 232 grams of the Ki. You would throw some like water in there. Give it a mix, mix, shaky, shaky, maybe not so much shaky. And you get that up to about 500 milliliters. And you should have then obviously a solution that has a molarity of 2.8 molar at that point. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> I'll try another one here. Uh, let's do. What is the. Uh, molarity of a sodium nitrate solution made by mixing 133 grams of sodium nitrate with enough water to make 375 milliliters of solution. All right, take a couple minutes to see what you got going there. Sodium 2299, nitrogen 1401, and oxygen 16. I'll do it as well since I just made it. Take a look. Uh, so obviously we are looking for molarity, which is our mole per liter. Uh, so we 
don't have moles, but we do have grams, so we could get to that. And we don't have it in liters yet, but we do have the volume, so we could obviously get to that as well. So we do need to do a couple conversions here. So we'll take the grams into uh, moles. So we do need the molar mass there of sodium nitrate. And that would obviously be uh, one of those guys, one of those guys, and three of those guys. So when we add that together, I believe we get 85 grams per mole. And if we do that here, relation, we're going to divide by that 85 grams. So we end up with moles. Grams here will cancel and that will give us 133 divided by 85 or call it uh, 1.565 moles of sodium nitrate. So that now is the top part here. For our bottom part, we're going to take that and divide it by a thousand to convert it into liters because we do need liters here. So that's going to give us 0.375 liters. And now that is the bottom part. So our molarity in this case uh, would be 1.565 moles up on top, 0 0.375 liters on the bottom. And we end up uh, with, looks like uh, 4.17. Now in terms of units, a do not cancel obviously. So you can leave it one of two ways, just as moles per liter if you like, or you could write 4.17 and big M and whatever this was here in sodium nitrate. So you could do it either way there. Any questions on that calculation there or how to calculate molarity? So molarity is used a lot. We are uh, definitely gonna use it a lot next week as well when we start doing titrations and stuff like that. Um, and it's a very common way, obviously, um, to talk about the concentration of the solution. Is it dilute or more concentrated? Any questions? All right, so obviously to prepare a solution, uh, which you will be doing next week as well, uh, maybe not from solid though. This is one way you could prepare it. This is uh, what is known as a volumetric flask. Volumetric usually means expensive. And it also means that there's usually just one marking. And on this particular one, that is the marking there. Uh, so if you had some type of solid, you put a little bit of solid in, pour a little bit of water, you wouldn't want to pour it all the way up because you would never get that thing to dissolve. And probably if you were going to do this, you would probably put in a beaker first, maybe with a little bit of water, it gets to start to dissolve a little bit and then put it in there. Uh, once you sort of get most of it dissolved, you may have to add a little bit more water as you're doing it, giving some mixing along the way. Once you got it pretty much dissolved, you can take it up into the neck of the flask and you do want to be really careful as you're filling it here. You know, you want to make sure that the meniscus there is at the line. Now, a very common thing that happens and hopefully will not happen next week is this. Um, you know, I kind of kind of missed the line there a little bit, just a little bit not all the way up. I kind of missed the line. Does it make a difference? Can you just pour out the solution at this point? You cannot because your solute is already mixed in there, right? So if you would pour out the solution back to the line, you just poured out some of your solute and you would not have the correct molarity and stuff like that. So a little caution for next week, be careful. Don't go over the line and start dumping solution like it's free. So uh, a lot of times like a medicine dropper or something like that, or a wash bottle where you have pretty good control to kind of get it to the line. Uh, is really what you want to kind of do there. Obviously, you put the cap on it back and forth, mix and mix it really well, and it will have hopefully a solution that you need. So let's talk a little bit about another type of problem that happens is, well, we end up with a lot of times uh, really concentrated solutions is how they typically will come. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as stock solutions. And a lot of times uh, when we go to use them, we do use sort of a more diluted version of it. So the process of dilution is something that we do a lot uh, with solutions. And basically the process of dilution is basically we're just gonna add more solvent. So a lot of times water is a common solvent. So we would add more water to it. The result of that is the moles of the solute, which by the way, in a solution, 
the thing that's really reacting is the solute, the stuff that's dissolved in there. That's really the stuff that is going to react. It's not really the water part uh, or the solvent in most cases. So the moles of the solute before and after the dilution do remain the same. The only difference is that you add more solvent like water, kind of like you get a beverage, you know, with some ice in it uh, from the fountain there and you go to class. And then afterwards, obviously all the ice has melted when you get back to your car. Uh, your soda does not taste as fresh and strong as it did before because it obviously has all this water kind of diluting it down and stuff like that. So uh, that is what happens. So in a dilution, basically the molarity goes down because molarity is moles of solute per liter of solution. When you add more solvent, the number that you're increasing is actually the bottom number here. So this number gets larger. So the liters of solution gets larger, which means the molarity gets smaller. So the molarity comes down because you're increasing the volume of solution. So as we can see in this picture, just add some more solvent, volume goes up, moles of solute stays the same, but the molarity does go down. And there is an equation that we use for this, and most people use it as M1V1 is equal to M2V2. M1 is molarity and V is volume. So uh, that is the initial molarity and volume, usually for your more concentrated solution. Doesn't necessarily have to be, but most people go the first ones is the more concentrated. The M2 and V2 is the diluted solution. So the one that's more diluted is typically what you do there. Now, <clears throat> this equation here is one of the equations where if you would like, you can leave the volume in milliliters as long as the other volume is milliliters and everything will work out okay. Or you can convert both volumes to liters and it will work out okay. You know, you could do it either way. Uh, but this is one of those ones where, as we were just talking about, if you did, for example, uh, M1, V1 is equal to M2, V2, and you had the molarity for this guy times the milliliters for that guy, and you're looking for the next molarity, and you have milliliters for this guy. When you times these two together, you get millimoles, and then when you divide this to the other side, you're going to be dividing by milliliters. The millis will cancel out, and you'll be back to moles per liter. So Again, in this situation, you can leave it in milliliters if you like, or you can convert it to liters. But once again, if you are not doing a dilution equation like this, and you're using molarity and volume, you do need to convert it to liters. Otherwise, you will be off. So molarity by itself in a non-dilution situation, you got to convert it to liters. In this situation, you can leave it in milliliters if you would like. Any questions on them there? <clears throat> When we solve for M1, that obviously is the concentration of the more concentrated solution in most cases. When you solve for V1, that's how much of the more concentrated solution you need to take out to make your new solution. M2 is the molarity of the diluted solution, and V2 is the total volume of your new diluted solution along the way. Now, this is the equation that most people use for dilutions. You will sometimes see people use this one, which is C1, V1 is equal to C2, V2 where C is just a generic name for concentration. And the reason for that is, technically speaking, you can use any concentration unit in this equation. So there's things like percent mass by mass we'll talk about, percent mass to volume, percent volume to volume. Uh, you can use any type of concentration unit. But because molarity is the most common unit used, that's why people kind of use M1V1 equals M2V2. But uh, if you see C1, V1 is equal to C2, V2, it's the same thing. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be molarity on both sides in terms of concentration. Any legit concentration there for a solution you could actually use in this equation. All right, so why don't you take a second here. How would we prepare 60 milliliters of 0.2 molar nitric acid from a stock solution? Of okay, let's take a look. Uh, so how would we prepare 60 milliliters of a 0.2 molar nitric acid solution from a stock solution of nitric acid that's four molar? Uh, so once again, here it is nitric acid and nitric acid. So we're really not doing any type of reaction. All we're doing is basically a dilution here. This is our more concentrated solution. So we could call M1 our four molar, if you like. 
Uh, V1, we don't know. Our M2 is what we're aiming for, which is 0.2 molar, and our V2 is going to be 60 milliliters. So using our M1, V1 is equal to M2, V2, we would want to solve for V1. So V1 would be M2, V2 divided by M1 as we divide this to the other side. Putting in our numbers in this case, and once again here, because we're using this equation, we really don't need to change the volume here. Uh, I'm going to leave it in milliliters, so we're going to have 0.2 molar times 60 milliliters, and we're going to divide it by our 4 molar. Now, again, the reason we don't need to change it is our molarities here will cancel, and we will be left with milliliters, so that's the only thing here. Obviously, the answer will be in milliliters, and we will end up with 0.2 times 60 uh, divided by 4 gives us 3 milliliters, it looks like. of nitric acid. Now, first off, any question on that calculation there? <clears throat> now, this three milliliters represents something here. So basically what we have going on here is we have a bottle here of four molar nitric acid, and we wanna make another solution that is 60 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar nitric acid. So what we just calculated in this case is the volume of the more concentrated nitric acid that we would need to take out of this bottle and into here. We would take our three milliliters and put it in there. <clears throat> now, should we add 60 milliliters of water to this case? The answer is no, because if we added 60 milliliters of water, in this case, we would end up with a total volume of 63, which is more than what we need. So a very common question that's oftentimes asked in dilution problems is, how much water do you need to add? So typically speaking, if you kind of do more dilute and less dilute, one and two in that order, uh, usually the volume of water is found by taking the V2 minus V1 in most cases. So if we did that in this case, we're shooting for 60 milliliters. We already put in there three milliliters and we need about 57 milliliters of water needs to be added. So we would add our 57 milliliters of water and we would mix it together here. And at that point, we would now have a total volume of 60 milliliters, and we should have a molarity that is 0.2 molar at that particular point. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so again, that's a very common sort of question and dilution problems is like how much water to add. So the difference in the two volumes is typically the amount of solvent or water that you added. Any questions on solutions there? <clears throat> Let's take a look at another one here. So how much water needs to be added to a 125 milliliter solution of, uh, we'll do five molar sodium chloride to make a 1.75 molar sodium chloride solution. All right, take a second, see what you come up with. I will as well. Okay, so once again here, uh, we have a more concentrated sodium chloride solution. We wanna make a more dilute sodium chloride solution. So that's an M1V1 is equal to M2V2 situation. At this point, uh, our M1 uh, would be five molar. Our V1 in this case is 125 milliliters. 
Uh, we do have an M2, which is the more dilute solution at 1.75. And that means that obviously we do not know V2. So that is a good place to solve for. So we're going to send M2 to the other side, and that will give us M1 V1 divided by M2 is equal to V2. Uh, once again here, I'm going to leave the uh, volume in milliliters. It means that I will end up with milliliters as my answer. And we're going to divide by our 1.75 molar. Again, milliliters stays as the molarity cancels. We end up with, in this case here, 5 times 125 divided by 175 there. We'll call it 357 milliliters. And again, this is uh, 375 milliliters in this case is our total volume of our dilute solution, right, of sodium chloride. So in this case, we are interested in how much water. So to find the volume of water, we're going to subtract those two, throw 357 milliliters minus the 125, tells us we need approximately 232 milliliters of water in this case. So if we were to go make this solution, once again, we would go and grab out of our more concentrated guy, we would take out there our 125 milliliters to start with. We would then add our 232 milliliters of water. And again, give it a nice mix and shake, and we should end up with a 1.75 molar solution that has a total volume of 357 milliliters. Any questions on dilutions? <clears throat> All right, so again, uh, in most cases, a lot of cases, water is something that's very commonly asked about. And again, um, if you solve for V1, that's usually the more concentrated solution, how much you're using. V2, again, your total volume. Any questions on dilution? Here? Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some stoichiometry and, and processes that are used uh, with solutions uh, that are sometimes done. One very common way uh, to determine uh, the an unknown substance and uh, basically how much you produce is through gravi gravimetric analysis. And this is a situation where uh, very common procedures, what we see here in the pictures, uh, you maybe have two solutions. When you mix them together, you get this precipitate that starts to form. Uh, this precipitate is really what's happening is the solute in each of those solutions coming together. And based on solubility rules, you get this precipitate that actually forms. Uh, we're actually interested in that product, and that would give us really our actual yield in this case. Uh, we would put it through a funnel. This is actually what's known as a Buchner funnel. This is vacuum filtration. You can kind of see the cord right there, or the rope right there. That's hooked to the vacuum line that's in our labs, for example, and you pour it in there, you do it, and it sucks down all the liquid part into the flask in the bottom here. The solid stays up on top. The precipitate stays on the filter paper. And that's a very nice way to do filtration rather than gravity filtration, where you just pour it into a funnel and you wait for it to drip and drip and drip. And sometimes it can take a very, very long time to do that. Uh, this is what we were talking about the other day when we were talking about sort of percent yield in a situation where you could get over 100% yield. And this is a situation where you would want to take that filter paper. And obviously, it's going to be very wet from the liquid that went through it and stuff like that. And if you don't completely dry that thing out and get rid of all the sort of the liquid part of it, uh, you will have extra water weight, if you will. And that will give you a greater actual yield than you should have had. And that can lead to a percent yield that's over 100%, which is not a great thing. So a lot of times what you do is because this filter paper there is wet, You'll either like put it into an oven for a bit and kind of dry it out and make sure all that water basically is out of there. Or you like leave it in your drawer for a day or two until it all kind of dries out really, really well. And then when you reweigh it, obviously what you would have on the filter paper would be your actual yield. And you could do based on your starting amounts there and stoichiometry, you could figure out your theoretical yield you should have got. And obviously, you could figure out something like the percent yield uh, from that actual experiment. So that's a very, very common 
a sort of experiment, a stoichiometry kind of experiment that's done there. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now, what we're going to do next week is also involving sort of stoichiometry, but it's more solution stoichiometry. And in this particular case, we're going to use the process known as titrations. And a titration is typically a process where we have kind of a known solution and an unknown solution when you do a titration. And the known solution means that you typically know the molarity and you know the volume that you used from it. The unknown, maybe all you know it is the volume that you are using of it. And we oftentimes will use something like uh, titrations to help us figure out things like what the molarity of an unknown solution is. And that's a very common process to do it. When we do a titration, we usually use what is known as a burette. And that is this guy right there. And we usually have a flask or a beaker underneath it that has a solution in it. This is, as we'll talk about, this is what's referred to as the uh, stopcock there. That is the on and off switch. And for future reference next week, this is off when it's in that position. This is on when it's like going the same way as the beer red. So you want to make sure it's off when you fill it, obviously, from the top. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, you're going to make a very big mess. Now, burettes are also very different in the sense that when you look at the readings on it, it actually increases as you go from the top down and you do fill it from the top. So when you fill a burette all the way to the top, that is 0, 0.00, usually two decimal places when you fill a burette. And if your volume ended up somewhere here, for example, that actually would be one point something, not two point something. So it increases as you go down. So it's very important to take a proper reading. When you do a titration, you should always take two readings. One is where you start with in terms of the volume and one is where you end with in terms of the volume. That's really important for it. So when we do a titration, what we're essentially doing is taking a reaction a lot of times to completion. And in a lot of cases, the titrations that we do a lot are acid-base titrations. So when we react an acid with a base, we make salt and water. Uh, so we take it to sort of that end point there. You can also do a titration that actually will produce a precipitate. But a lot of times we don't do that too much uh, in school. And stuff, but you can do that as well. But a lot of times acid-base titrations is commonly what we do. How do we know when the reaction is over? Well, we really go to what is referred to as the equivalence point. And the equivalence point in a titration is the point where the reaction is complete. And if you're doing an acid-base titration like we will do next week, acid-base titration, that is the point where exactly the moles of the acid will equal the moles of the base. So that is the exact point where pretty much if you neutralize everything that's there all the acid you started with has now been completely used up by all the base that you've added in this particular case and that is typically where you want to kind of stop your titration at the equivalence point that is not to be confused with what is sometimes referred to as the end point of a titration the end point of a titration is pretty much what it sounds like it is where you lay up your titration and go i'm good i'm gonna call it a day so if you do a good titration, the end point, the equivalence point should be pretty close to one another. If you do a crappy titration, they are very far away from each other, but you obviously would want to do a good titration. So how do you know when you've reached the equivalence point? We usually will use an indicator to help us visually sort of see that we have reached the end point. Phenol failing is a very common one and we'll use it next week. Phenol phthalene is an indicator and it is colorless, for example. And acidic solutions and neutral solutions. And it actually turns a nice shade of pink and basic solutions. So when we do a titration, we typically want to pick an indicator that will actually change color near the equivalence point in the titration that we're doing. So for example, next week, we're doing a little acetic acid, some vinegar and some sodium hydroxide titration. That equivalence point is basic, like 8.7-ish or somewhere in that ballpark. And that is going to be where this indicator works. Indicators actually work over a pH range. So something like phenolphthalein, 
works from like a pH of 8.3 to like a pH of 10. And at 8.3, it's really kind of colorless. Then it gradually becomes pink as you head this way to like super dark pink. My favorite color as you're doing titrations, super, super dark pink. Um, and that tells you that it should end. When we do a titration like this, as we will talk about next week as well, you typically want to stop your titration at the very, very lightest color of pink that you can see. And the reason for that is that should put you really at the correct pH over in this range. And that should put you closer to where the equivalence point is. If you go super, super dark pink, you might have way jumped the equivalence point too far. So it's kind of what you try to do there. That's actually not bad what we see here. And that's what we see in this picture here, that kind of light pinkish color. And that indicates that the titration is at the equivalence point. When we talk about that, it's like so light pink, like you got to put like a white piece of paper underneath it to kind of see the pink is sort of what you're shooting for. Um, but in reality, it doesn't really matter as long as your volumes are relatively close to each other. And the reason for that is, and you'll learn more about it when you do take 200B, if you do take 200B, but if we do something like what is referred to as a titration curve, it looks something like this, say volume of sodium hydroxide or base added. And in a titration like we're gonna do next week, it looks something like this, this curve where the equivalence points over here. And we'll say, hey, that's maybe like a pH of eight, eight, nine and so forth. So when you do this and you're doing it with the indicator, you know, it's gonna be colorless, it's gonna be colorless, it's gonna see some, as soon as the indicator hits some of the sodium hydroxide, or you drop the sodium hydroxide in there, it's gonna go pink from that, but it'll go away. You'll keep mixing, you'll keep mixing. The pink will stay a little bit longer and a little bit longer as you're doing your titration, as you keep adding the sodium hydroxide. And again, for reference point, the sodium hydroxide, which is the base would be up in the burette. Your acid would be on the bottom here with your indicator. So as you keep dropping this acid, again, it will go pink because it hits the sodium hydroxide, but kind of goes away goes away, stays longer, longer. And as it's staying longer and longer, that means you're going to be reaching the equivalence point really, really soon. And what happens, what frustrates most people is at this point, your solution is kind of colorless. And then you go, okay, I'll add one drop. And they add like one single drop and it goes from like colorless to like super dark pink. And they're like, I just added one drop. I didn't add a lot. And that is because as you approach the equivalence point, the volume here goes vertical. So if the volume goes vertical, what that means in terms of the pH is you do not need a lot of volume to change the pH a lot. And the reason why it goes from like no color or colorless to like super dark pink with like just one drop, maybe two drops is because even though you added a little bit of volume, you change the pH a lot, which means when we think about our indicator, which works at a 8.3 to 10 range, and this is colorless here. And this is like really dark pink on this end. By just adding that one drop, you've changed the pH a lot. So it becomes very, very dark pink. But if you're titrating and you're very, very careful as you're doing the titration and you only miss the equivalence point by like one drop or you added only one drop, you would be like say up here in the pH, right? A pH of 10-ish or something like that, which that right there and really where the... <clears throat> So let's say you just added that one drop and you got the pH way up there, but that's the equivalence point. And the most important thing when you do a titration is actually the volume of base, for example, that you added is the volume of base that difference between those two points. The answer is it is not. It's basically the same location. So even if you missed the equivalence point by one drop and it got really super dark pink, it's not really a big issue. The reason they tell you that you want the lightest color of pink is because if you are not careful, like me, when I was younger and I titrated, I opened it up, let it drain, shut it, gave it a mix. Hey, it's pink. I'm good. And I have no idea really how much I added or if I was very careful, I could get the same color of pink way over here, right? And that would be really dark pink as well. And if we go down, that is a very big difference in the volume of where the equivalence point should be in there. So 
That's why when we do a titration like this, you want to make sure that you get the lightest color of pink because that should put you near the equivalence point. But even in reality, if you're really careful as you're titrating and you just kind of go really dark pink and you've been adding like one drop at a time, you're probably okay as long as your volumes for all the titrations you do are about the same volume. But if you're really not very careful and you just open it up and just let it drain in, you could find yourself over here with the same color of the indicator at that point, and you could have missed your equivalence point by a very, very large amount. So although people try to beat into your head that you should always get the lightest color of pink when you do titrations, it really doesn't truly matter as long as the volumes that you get for each trial that you do, because you do multiple trials usually when you do a titration, as long as those volumes are relatively the same, it should be okay. That was our extended titration conversation. Any questions on that there? Okay, we're laid up there, I 